I didn't know there'd be so many hills. That way? <laughs> ah, it's a big one. It's quite big. Madagascar is a wonderland for biodiversity. There are unique, fascinating creatures here found nowhere else on Earth. There are more than 100 species of lemur on this East African island. They're a sight to behold, but it's wise to keep your distance. Tropical rainforests are a Pandora's box for zoonotic diseases that pass from animals to humans, where a new virus could emerge and cause the next pandemic. Madagascar is one of the poorer countries in Africa. People are vulnerable to infections from wild animals. <laughs> We are interacting more and more with animals and we're encroaching more and more into natural habitats. I think people should be concerned about Madagascar. In the final episode of a series about pandemic preparedness, we ask how do we contain disease outbreaks in remote corners of the planet and protect our biggest cities? So let's flatten the curve. I am so excited every time I see lemurs. They are, uh, they're very cute. Dr. Fidisu Raisambai Nariv is fascinated by the unique creatures of his island home. He trained as a wildlife veterinarian here at the Ivalun Zoo on Madagascar's east coast. Now a leading specialist in zoonotic diseases, lemurs are his top concern. So what makes them vulnerable to zoonotic diseases? First of all, they are primates, and so they are closer to, to us than any other species that are in, in Madagascar. Captive lemurs in Madagascar have caught tuberculosis and giardia from humans. But the danger of infection runs both ways because they're often traded illegally and kept as pets. Can you just explain how zoonotic diseases could spread from these animals to humans. There could be a mosquito that bite them and bite us afterwards and transmit, uh, transmit parasites. As we stand close to the animals, we share the same air. There's potential for viruses or bacteria to be transmitted that way as well. Today, Dr. Rasam Banariv is performing an autopsy on a lemur which died the previous day at the zoo. Samples he gathers from this animal will go back to a laboratory he set up in Madagascar's capital city. So I'm looking under the skin to see if there's traces of uh, hematoma, for example. It's a chance to further his research into what factors make them vulnerable to disease. So, there's a lot that we don't know. What is a healthy lemur in the natural habitats? But also, how do we uh, maintain their, their health? We do not know all the different parasites and viruses and bacteria that the lemurs may have. Leading a team of students, he conducts field research in Madagascar's remotest rainforests for an American university. This is a camera trap. When you have an animal... They're trapping, the testing and releasing native animals to see if they're catching diseases from humans or domestic animals. This. Such studies are vital, with Africa facing a dramatic increase in deadly zoonotic outbreaks. How does your work help us understand zoonotic diseases? So what I've learned so far is that we've seen much more domestic animals, such as dogs and cats, going into there than I anticipated. Another thing that I've learned is that those dogs and cats indeed do carry bacteria and viruses in their feces, and those do infect the wild species of, of Madagascar. With close to two-thirds of Madagascar's population living in rural areas, 
Monitoring the health of animals in villages is key to stopping zoonotic disease outbreaks. The Mad Dog Initiative is a non-profit organisation that neuters domestic pets and stray animals near two national parks. Anj Nandrian Rahanirin is leading a team of vets busy vaccinating dogs and cats in a local village. The main focus is reducing rabies, a zoonotic disease caused by animal bites which kills close to 1,000 people across the island nation every year. Ange says the Mad Dog Initiative also tries to educate local communities. Later that evening, we join Nicola Andrianako by the campfire. He often hunts and eats wild animals, known as bushmeat. Today, he's caught some native tenrex, a rat-sized mammal. What does it taste like? Tuvim ksuizu. Fa. Nicola doesn't see any dangers from bushmeat, even though bat hunting was the likely cause of Africa's worst Ebola outbreak, which killed more than 11,000 people. Do you eat any other kind of bushmeat? Ni aswana ni ramanavia, ni chandaka, piplava, ni refaita ni natiala zanti, tomne zani aswana la tomne kapia zani. Samanuka na zani ni piptuang kete madakaskara, tinkiru. It's estimated that 60 to 75 percent of the infectious diseases that affect humans originate in animals. And 1.8 billion people on our planet now live in areas where they're at high risk of zoonotic disease exposure. Tropical disease specialist Professor Peter Horby has been on the front lines of many zoonotic outbreaks. Wild animal bushmeat trafficking and live animal markets are definite risk factors. They are, though, you know, quite traditional practices, and it can be challenging because it's an industry um, mm. and it's very sort of focused on you know, productivity and um, profitability. As well as the hunting and trafficking of wildlife, the rapid destruction of the environment across the global south increases the risk of zoonotic disease outbreaks. Madagascar has lost half of its rainforests due to logging and agriculture, not to mention the harvesting of firewood and charcoal for cooking. Dr. Rasim Bainariv believes the growing number of villages in and around rainforests is a recipe for disaster. Hotspots of zoonotic disease 
tend to be places where you have high biodiversity and high human population uh, with increased interactions with uh, domestic animals, wildlife, and in, in the natural habitat. Madagascar checks all of these different boxes. Madagascar has one of the highest rates of plague in the world, spread via fleas, usually from rats. 80% of the population live on $2 a day. Few can access professional medical care or proper sanitation. This country was one of the least vaccinated in Africa for COVID-19. And low childhood immunisation rates have led to measles outbreaks. Nicola lost four members of his extended family to COVID-19. He's only been vaccinated once and says most villagers opt instead for unproven natural remedies, like a herbal tonic pushed by Madagascar's president. It's not known whether these uh, remedies were effective at all. Dr. Rasam Banariv studied Madagascar's COVID-19 response closely. The authorities are not equipped enough to respond to an outbreak. To prevent pandemics in vulnerable nations like Madagascar, he says there needs to be more funding for programs based on a philosophy called One Health. So One Health is uh, this field and concept of uh, interconnectedness between human health, animal health and uh, in environmental health. His work and the Mad Dog Initiative are examples of One Health projects being implemented by scientists, NGOs and communities across the planet. The issue is that disease surveillance is a resource intensive um, field. A lot of resources and capabilities are present in the uh, Western world, uh, whereas a lot of those interactions with domestic and wild animals, with humans, occur in countries like in Madagascar. The World Health Organization wants to embed One Health principles into frameworks for pandemic preparedness. But its deputy director, Dr. Michael Ryan, says Global South nations are reluctant. They want to understand what's that going to cost us. We're already dealing with the climate crisis, dealing with the whole animal-human interface. That has real costs to an economy. If you're living on a dollar a day, the last thing you're thinking about One Health, you're thinking about your kid who has diarrhea because they're drinking dirty water. That's what you want fixed. You're not worried about uh, a monkey up a tree in some far off jungle. Ensuring poor countries are pandemic prepared matters to everyone. COVID-19 proved that disease can spread at lightning speed across an interconnected planet that's rapidly urbanising. The world's biggest cities, many of which are in industrialised nations, became front lines in the battle to contain the virus. Dr Ashwin Varsan is the health commissioner of New York City, which became the first epicentre for the COVID-19 pandemic in the US. In New York City, we've lost about 50,000 people total. 50% of them died in the first three months. COVID should have taught us that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. He says safeguarding major cities requires more global attention, with most officials still left to their own devices when it comes to pandemic preparedness. We expect over the next 25 to 50 years that that will be upwards of 80% of humanity living in cities. And these cities are very much canaries in the coal mine. Can I say for certain that cities are prepared? Not today. Across the Atlantic, Belgium suffered the highest death toll in Europe when COVID-19 hit the continent in 2020. 
In response, city officials quickly altered the capital Brussels, making streets downtown more pedestrian friendly and establishing bike corridors. Tropical disease expert Dr Erika Vliga advises the Belgian government on pandemic preparedness. Taking care of pedestrians can help to, to control infections. Uh, uh, first of all, the, the risk of being infected outdoors is, is, is much lower as compared to indoors. But secondly, and I think much more important, if you invest in, in pedestrianized areas, um, that means you're also reducing um, exhaust which affects your lungs and which um, makes your body much more vulnerable for any infection. It's also encouraged that indoor spaces for public gatherings, like this local pub, install carbon dioxide monitors to measure the risk of transmission of airborne diseases. So the, the higher the CO2 is, the more um, likely it is that viruses can circulate and can be transmitted. When the CO2 concentrates already a bit, it blinks orange, and when it really goes above a dangerous level where it is very likely that viral transmission may occur, it will blink red. And that is like a sign that you need to, to have a current of fresh air to open the windows, to open the doors, etc. New buildings in Belgium have to adhere to higher standards of ventilation. But do these initiatives work? There are measures like CO2 monitoring, like increased ventilation, like increased ultraviolet light that can play a role. None of these are you know, magic wands, but it, together, if you layer all these things together, you can reduce the risk of transmission of infections. When it comes to pandemic preparedness, the greatest vulnerability across this ageing continent remains the elderly. Elka Plovi's 71-year-old father, Eddie, caught COVID-19 while visiting his sister in a nursing home during Belgium's second wave in November 2020. When my father was brought in into the hospital, it was like panic over there, under staff. So I could feel the stress in the first wave. There was a lot of attention. And I've, I was thinking that the second wave, they would have been prepared for this situation. I remember very well the last time he called me because at that time his breathing was really difficult. And then he said, yeah, this is it. I'll have to uh, put the phone down. And then the nurse, she said, yeah, we're going to intubate him because it's really too difficult for him to uh, keep on breathing. Uh, like this. But then when my father died, uh, for me it was really, really, um, yeah, how should I say it? I, it, it? I think it was the most lonely time I've, I've ever felt in my life because um, you suffer from something and you cannot share it with anybody. As the years pass since his death, what stays with Elke is the sense of a cold clinical medical system under severe strain. They phoned me like one minute, that was it. Your father died, you can collect his belongings tonight at six o'clock, and that was it. I was really, really angry that they didn't really um, say anything about how he was, was he scared, also the fact that he died on his own. How does this system need to improve? Well, the COVID crisis showed me that there was a lot of inhuman behaviour or unhuman behaviour. People were treated as patients, as numbers, like you were a number on a computer, and that was it. As the virus swept across the United Kingdom and Europe, nursing homes became the epicentre of tragedy. Few facilities had disease infection guidelines. Staff struggled to obtain protective equipment and weren't trained how to use it. During the first wave, Two out of three COVID-19 deaths in Belgium were in nursing homes. Amnesty International found local authorities were slow to implement protective measures in the aged care sector and didn't seek hospital treatment for many infected patients. We understood only later that um, the, the biggest massacre, if I may call it that way, was taking place in nursing homes. They were absolutely not prepared for such an enormous um, uh, amount of people dying in, in, in high numbers. I think another thing was our public health authorities absolutely not being prepared, maybe being 
overconfident, like, yeah, we are Belgium, what could happen? The Lingert, a private nursing home in the city of Leuven, provides specialised dementia care to 120 residents. Patients are spread across several communal units, like this one, with dedicated teams of carers. And from which firm was you? Baxter was it? No, it was a private. A private firm. Yeah. Yeah. That was for 40 years. 40 years. Yeah, but my whole career. When COVID-19 hit, the Vingard's director Jan van Wieser took a different approach to most aged care facilities. He prioritised quality of life. When patients fell sick, they weren't confined to their rooms and family members were allowed to visit them. We immediately decided to cut off all the houses from each other and uh, considered them as bubbles. Uh, and we gave a lot of trust and autonomy to all the staff members and we said, look, you, you know what to do. Uh, and this was, I think, key to uh, that, we, that we had less uh, contaminations. But key to that was that we had the trust of all the families that they accept that if somebody gets COVID in one of our houses of eight people, that everybody would be infected. And one of the most important things is how do you, do you cope with mourning? Uh, if somebody dies, this, this, this is only once, you cannot redo it. And dying alone uh, is, is for us, um, it was a no-go. Jan van Wieser's approach is now the subject of a university study which has garnered interest from Belgian government officials. The reason? Far fewer patients died here compared to bigger government aged care facilities. Reducing the risk of COVID was of course our aim. Eh? Uh, let, let's be clear on that, uh, but not at all costs. So you, basically what you're saying is sometimes the social dimensions of the crisis have to be given more emphasis than perhaps the threat to health. Yeah, and, and, it, and, and you should re-evaluate every day. There were points in time where we uh, evaluated directions given by the government uh, and that we were prepared to go all together to prison uh, if, if somebody would sanction for it. But it was an ethical uh, red line which we didn't want to cross. Frontliners like Jan were forced to make critical decisions during the COVID-19 pandemic. But future catastrophic disease outbreaks could present even more daunting ethical challenges. The pandemic has really shone a light on the, the ethical and moral dilemmas that are faced um, with controlling disease. It comes down often to a value judgment. Do you want to protect everyone absolutely from infection or do you also put more weight on the economy? Um, or education. When you are confronted with a limited amount of goods, there's always choices that you need to make. We had a limited amount of beds or ventilators, and then and that means you have to think um, who is most likely to survive. And that means you have to have these debates long before um, a pandemic hits. From the remotest corners of Africa to major global capitals, we've seen very different ways in which communities have learnt from COVID-19 and how they are preparing for future pandemics. What they all have in common is a need for more funding and resources. It's all wonderful to have these plans, but at the end of the day, you need resources. You need to have more investment into public health. And so the, uh, that has to be the call tack. COVID-19 put our pandemic preparedness to the test. And the experts say, we failed. Complacency could see history repeating if we don't take the threat of disease more seriously. Some countries responded well, others didn't. But I would say overall, our level of preparation was poor. The world is not a very easy place right now. The frequency and intensity of health emergencies is rising. Our health systems need to be made stronger. We're in a very divided geopolitical world. Uh, there's an awful lot at stake. But the one thing that I think everyone agrees on is health is a human right. The protection of health is important to every nation. 
And we can't achieve that unless we cooperate. It's a simple fact. That was the final episode of Flatten the Curve. In our other episodes, we examine the challenges in preparing for the next pandemic and ask if a new global treaty can address vaccine inequity. To watch the series, go to aje.io forward slash virus. Thanks for watching.